But it was incredibly influential. I mean, you were talking about how this was the first uh, monster with a personality. Um, suddenly, all the horror movies had monstrous people who did punchlines. Yes. And I don't think they really got what was so fantastic about the Nightmare on Elm Street series, particularly the first one, uh, is tapping into the subconscious is an incredibly effective way to, to prick the fears of the audience. And Freddy's punchlines were always about some flaw or fear or secret that that character had. Uh, you know, even if even something as overt as you can check in, but you can't check out from the mm -hmm. old Roach Motel commercials was directed at a girl that Freddie had just put through a Kafka-esque hell with her fear of insects by literally turning her into one. Right, right. You know, which is as Kafka as you can get. I mean, Well, that, that was you know, in Nightmare 3, right? That was that in was... Nightmare on Elm Street 3. But, you know, yes, there was the corny punchline that became a catchphrase, but that sequence is so true. It's amazing. To like a, a, a kind of Freddy through line and, and very imaginative. Um, and, and I like that. You know, I mean, that, that's right out of Metamorphosis. And right. there was always enough of, of those in there. Or, or, the, or the accompanying image that was so strong. Well, there were great set pieces, and I remember when Nightmare 3 was shooting, um, I think there were five units going at one time, <laughs> shooting all these incredible sequences. <laughs> Rennie would be at a couple of them, oh. but there were things going on all the time because each of these was a self-contained, uh, if it had music, would be a music video, but they were these great set pieces that were so imaginative and so bizarre, and that, uh, you know, uh, Frank Darabont, certainly certainly yes. brought a lot to the party, and that was kind of the beginning of his career. I know, and we, the, the, if you look at the writers, and the directors of photography, every time I turn on CSI or one of these shows, it's one of my DPs you yeah. know, that, that have yeah. given it the look, which, you know, for television, which is amazing to me. Uh, and we had some wonderful directors then, Rennie Harlan and Stephen Hopkins, but on Rennie's shoot, I think it was Nightmare 4, I remember one morning I went in, really, God, I was beat. You know, I, I'd been wearing the makeup so long, and I, 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 I drove my car off the off-ramp. We were way out in Santa Clarita. It was 100 degrees already at, like, 5 in the morning. And, you know, my skin, I was like a dog going to the vet. I didn't want to go. <laughs> and I got out, and the dawn was coming up, and we were at this old industrial space out there. They'd converted into a sound stage. And there was some beautiful girl wearing nothing but a pair of bib overalls, an art department intern. And she was drawing in pastel chalk a hopscotch on the sidewalk. And it was like the little one, two, Freddy's coming for you yeah. girls had drawn, you know, a Freddy Krueger hopscotch game. You know, it was all macabre. And I remember walking by that and looking at that, you know, and going, here we go again. <laughs> this is so strange. But it was that old joke. We know, like New York, we never close. Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street 4, I think they shot around the clock. And on that movie, it was the only time my father ever came to visit me on a set. Really? Never saw me do a play in his life. Wow. And, and uh, came to visit on the set. I was working second or third unit with Steve Johnson, the effect meister's crew. This is the man that did that fabulous jaw effect in uh, Blade Two that mm -hmm. still gives me the creeps. Well, he did the stand in The Shining with and me. Why, yeah. you, I know, you, yes. you treated, you've done very well for Mr. Johnson. <laughs> but uh, Steve's crew was out there, and they had me there, and they literally had me crucified onto a piece of three-quarter inch plywood with the chest of souls on me mm -hmm. because I couldn't move. Because if I moved, they couldn't cut to the giant mock-up that they had. They had an actual giant torso of Robert England with real people crawling out of it, <laughs> you know? And I had to be very, very still so that they could do the intercut shots so that the scale would work. And, and there were like guys running around with Makitas making sure I didn't move and screwing me tighter and tighter. <laughs> and this is before CGI. They had all these hydraulics running down me and these little twitching gears and things. You know, I was like St. Sebastian up there with the arrows. I, I mean, I was in absolute misery. And then I hear this voice and it's like, Robbie, which is what my dad calls me, you know? And I look out and there's my dad standing out there beaming at me. And it was, you know, the old, uh, the guy that follows the elephants around with a push broom, you know. <laughs> what? And give up showbiz, dad? You know. <laughs>
So that was on Rennie. You know, Rennie, yeah, Rennie got us, Rennie hurt me. <laughs> Rennie, yeah, Rennie worked me hard. <laughs> well, there's nothing like getting a physical response, and it's interesting how comedy and horror go for similar reactions. You're going, you know something's working if people are laughing at the right moments, and you know something's working if people are really quiet and jump and feel the tension and they're gripping the edge of their chairs. You know, I think horror and humor have a lot in common there, and you've done a lot of both of those things. I began in comedy, Mick, and sometimes now, uh, there's a fusion of horror and comedy. You get to play around, but I got to do some Jerry Lewis shtick in a little uh, horror comedy called Jack Brooks Monster Slayer. But sometimes you're called upon to be melodramatic in horror. Sometimes you're called upon to be documentary, real, and truthful. And I love both of those places. Many of your contemporaries, too. You know, uh, Wes, Craven, Sam Raimi, uh, uh, Joe Dante, all used a little bit of comedy in their early horror work to relieve the tension. Because uh, I don't think you can just scare people for 90 minutes. I think you need to relieve that tension or else you get in, you fall, you can go into that dangerous area where people are laughing at you, not with mm -hmm. you. Uh, they are laughing because they need to be relieved of their tension. Uh, and it's that nervous laughter or that And you can flatline laugh. too. You know, if yeah. you're the same level all the way through, it's just as boring if it's way up here as if it's way down here. You need the up and down. But it's relentless. You can't be funny for 90 minutes. And you also can't, I think you can't be scary for 90 minutes either. I think you have to mix it up a little bit. Even if you dare stray into sentimentality. I think you gotta do that. Well, you know, people, I think, believe that Hitchcock was the first one to do that and who would talk about how you need to diffuse the tension with humor. But even as far back as 1935 with Bride of Frankenstein, you know, mm. James Whale had a lot of really florid humor in between these f scenes of fantastic horror. Yeah, you, have, you have a mind like a steel trap. Is it Ernst Thesiger? Ernest Thesinger. Yeah. Ernest Thesinger. 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 Yeah. Yes, I mean, that's truly one of the first great intentionally camp performances, but straddled the line so wonderfully and created such an original character. But you're right, I'd forgotten. James Whale certainly used that technique. Yeah. yeah. All we got to do today is look at the box office the last 10 to 15 years. There's been a horror film or a fantasy film or a science fiction film in the top 10. And we've become the sort of go-to genre for a guaranteed hit, just like the Western from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And you've been around long enough to remember when we always didn't get the best table in the commissaries. <laughs> you know, they oh, kind of yeah. put the horror guys back by the doors to the kitchen. You mean you that's know? changed? <laughs> yeah, not... Well, it's a little better now, <laughs> yeah. you know. I, I, it's a little better now. And uh, I also think we're supported by a, several generations of fans now. And you know, I mean, uh, haven't had your hand in several classics. I mean, you know, that, that those fans now that we used to mock, whether it was the Trekkies or, or, or the, the word geek, which is a little unkind, uh, especially if you've seen Nightmare Alley starring to <laughs> own power. But what, but I'm, what I'm saying, that those fans that we didn't take so seriously, uh, they're running the show now. They're running the town now. They're writing the, the A movies now. They're the gamers, designers. Uh, which I think, from what I understand, is the biggest grossing industry next to biotech right, <laughs> in yeah, America. Yeah. And, and I'm kind of happy to have been in there, not at the beginning, certainly, but at the sort of beginning of MTV, VCRs, beta, you know, DVD, Blu-ray, cable, all of those things which have given me several generations of fans, which enable me and to be... And even now the internet with the Fear The internet Clinic. with Fear Clinic on, on fearnet.com, which is, you know, we're trying to wrap our mind around this truncated narrative, you know, for the internet, but it's, it's building this fan base again that was always there. You know, I mean, I remember them accusing us of exploiting uh, uh, Friday the 13th and, and Nightmare on Elm Street with... Um, uh, Freddy versus Jason, and I said, "What? Don't 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 you, don't you people remember Frankenstein meets the Wolfman, <laughs> or House of Frankenstein with five count them five, five count them five? Monsters. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, I said this, we are this is a direct Valentine yeah. to the fan, 
the 14-year-old boy who says, said to me a week after the first Nightmare on Elm Street came out, uh, excuse me, Mr. England, sir, dude, uh, like what would happen, you know, if you duked it out with Michael Myers? <laughs> you know, if, uh, like what is Dracula dreams? If he's really sleeping in the coffin, could you kick his ass? <laughs> you know, they, this is what they do. It's like that, uh, that opening scene in Diner, you right, know, where they're all right, sitting right. around asking which, uh, which Cartwright brother could kick the other one's butt from Bonanza. <laughs> <you know? laughs> You've always been a very observant actor from the brief time we worked together on Freddy's Nightmares and to watching you work on the set at Masters of Horror. You always seem to be taking it in and more than just what you're doing, more than your work as an actor, the whole mise-en-scene around you. And I know you've made three films, I think it is, as a director. And uh, tell me about that transition and about the different experience and how one informs the other. I am not a filmmaker. You're a filmmaker. Mm. I am a gun for hire mm. as a director. But I am a good. I am good in casting. Uh, I have a great love for actors. It's very difficult for me to to in, in the casting session because I have such empathy with actors. You want to hire them all. I do, and so many of them actually read the best, but they're too old, or they're too young, or they're too tall, or they're too short, or they're whatever. And and you have to say no to them, and it, it, that that's not a pleasant thing for me, but I am good at it. I also have a, have a, a, some aesthetic for the art department, uh, wardrobe uh, and scenery, where I must surrender, and where my vocabulary often fails me, is, is camera and lighting. Uh, I have a sense of when the camera should move and of cinematic language, uh, but I'm really open all the time to help on, on those three points. And uh, I, I love post, and I thought I would love shooting, but uh, shooting is all, to me, it's about, I just worry about money, right. and I don't want to, and I try to love my actors and protect them. Make your them. days, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I try to be nice to everybody and learn everybody's name. Uh, but I do love post, and I never thought I would, and that's probably the most technical part of filmmaking, and that's probably should be my weakest part, but there's nothing like realizing that you can shuffle the deck and scenes that you thought were set in stone and don't really have to be in that order. Or you're in the sound mix and you realize that a scene that kind of lies there, you put a train whistle in it or, or, or bird song or a, a sprinkler ch 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 mm. to tell you it's summer or anything like that. And then that just, I mean, you get this other inspiration that happens, you know, and, and, then, and then it seems like the people you're working with kind of read your mind and then they give you more and more ideas and, and then you get into music and you, and you get into color timing and all that. But I mean, I love that and I luxuriate in that. I'm not too old for that, but I gotta tell you, you know, I get on a shoot now and you know, it's, boy, you get done with it and then you're prepping. And, uh, and I'm also not, I mean, I, I, I love the storyboard for a fight sequence and for a fantasy sequence. You know, th there's a time and a place for storyboards, but I cannot marry myself to that all the time. Otherwise, it's a graphic novel. I think I you agree. have to be open sometimes to the happy accident, especially if you've hired a great location scout. And you get there and you realize, my God, look at if I stand on that side of the street, what I've got. You're strangled by storyboards, I think, unless you're doing something where everybody needs to be on the same page, like stunts or, like yeah. you said, action scenes or something. The discovery, yeah. the discovery when you're there, an actor wants to come from a different side of the room or a window opens a different way or something, you find find things that are much better than you've drawn so many times. Yeah.